diesel engines they come in in two of the two power points the first power point is actually for semester 7 that uh, sorry the second uh, power point will be for semester second for their practical test in any case if some of you are interested i will share that powerpoint program also and it has there is a little overlap between maintenance of diesel engines 1 and maintenance of diesel engines 2 all right so we can begin i hope 28 boys are seen here and today will be possibly the last class that we are having so this powerpoint is little long and it consists of a lot of modern techniques which we have and it's not likely that we will to finish it but i have proposed to share this powerpoint universally with all the students so on your own you can go through this maintenance of diesel engine maintenance of diesel engine is a very 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 wide scope of a subject or there is almost no end to it so it's very difficult to actually compile all the data in one powerpoint so that is why i have proposed that i will share this entire powerpoint apart from the link i will also share the powerpoint with all the students so you can keep it as a reference and you can keep it as a learning note also i would also like to know from faran what was the progress in the mock test that i gave you i gave you the questions first to ensure that you start the paper and assess yourself how well you can do that mock paper and thereafter yesterday i think i sent all the answer with the with that mock test so you could have compared there were some requests for sharing the answers because i think most of the students could do between 50 and 60 questions without any doubt it is the remaining 20 questions yes sir yes sir that is what has happened uh, there were around 10 to 15 questions where uh, we were uh, uh, a dilemma about. between two options so okay. we wanted and we wanted an answer and as such you wrote in the first uh, like uh, uh, in the email that you sent the questions you told us that you will be sending the answers by thursday and we received it so wasn't much okay. of a problem okay good i hope you have genuinely and thoroughly gone through that question paper because that is just a guide and the questions that are going to come are going to maybe there would be some differences because you know it all de de depends on what questions they select not what imu has has got a huge question bank from there they will select the questions and compile a question paper so you need to do a lot of questions multi choice questions and also understand them because sometimes they will change the options that are there and change the wordings over there they are also aware that a lot of boys are going to mug up the answers which is not a right way of learning so it is best that you practice and understand why that particular answer is the correct answer and why the other answers are not the correct answers some of the questions you will see where the options are very very closely related there is almost no difference between the options and you will have to pick one of them then it becomes difficult if the options are absolutely varied then it becomes very simple but that is not going to happen that amount to actually uh, you know not a very proper way of conducting an examination the examination should be connect, conducted in a way where it gives genuine exercise of finding out whether you know the subject or not so that is the whole idea behind these multi choice questions So, so that's the, where we were lacking actually i mean uh, the questions that you mentioned like the two options are very close i mean they were uh, kind of if uh, on first look they were separated by nothing we some we sometimes felt that this is just another language of writing that same option so uh, that is where we were confused and so we needed the answers for further clarification okay some of the questions i have originated they are not anywhere no books no us guard no previously so i have made some questions which are absolutely original 
So there, I probably think, I think maybe you got had some difficulty. That is why I've sent you the answers also. Anyway, it's a learning process, and your learning process is never going to end. Even when you're a chief engineer, even when you're at my stage, I'm also still learning a lot of things that I don't know about. So it is a never ending process. So let us start with our maintenance of diesel engines. We will try to go as fast as possible. Now, maintenance has got a very wide scope of understanding. When you do MBA or go into higher studies, you will find there are split hairs. Split hairs meaning the term maintenance has been divided into 20 different terms or 20 different ways maintenance can be done. For us as marine engineers on board the ship, we can distinguish maintenance in broadly three terms. And I hope you stick to this because this is the best guideline. If you go into the MBA level of understanding what is maintenance, it's very, very confusing. They have made put more words, more fancy words, more descriptions, made it very flowery and made the subject even more complicated. So I have kept it very simple in broad basing what maintenance is about. So let us start with the first page what we have. The, the types of maintenance that can be broadly distinguished or broadly be distinguished as number one, preventive maintenance. And that is usually called routine maintenance. The second one is breakdown maintenance. Now, this breakdown maintenance is going to be a little change in the concept that a normal person has. From a technical point of view, breakdown maintenance means a little different from what a normal person understands. And the third one is called predictive maintenance. So maintenance for machinery, for engines, everything else is can be broadly based under three different headings. We are all aware of what is preventive maintenance. In other words, you open up a machine, check on it, clean it up, check for any damage and put it back. Even if it is not being given trouble, even if there has been no complaints, every few hundred or thousand hours, you are required to open it up, clean it, check it, put it back. That's the way it is. So something like fuel injectors. Now, on board the ship, you will find every 1500 hours, you are required to remove all the fuel injectors, pressure test them, and if they are faulty, then you service them and then put them back. Okay. So this is called routine maintenance. This goes for almost every machinery for the older ships. The older ships are still continuing with preventive maintenance or routine maintenance. That means every 10,000 hours, you have to open up the distributor or every, depends on how many hours the manufacturer has specified. You open the distributor, you took out all the pilot valves, check the springs for corrosion, check the uh, freeness of the pilot piston, check the condition of the cam, clean them up, maybe polish them up. You need sometimes need an oil stone to smoothen the cam surfaces, which may be scored. So then box it up. Again, after the next 10,000 hours, again, you open it up. So this is called preventive maintenance. And this goes for almost every item inside the engine room. Preventive maintenance or routine maintenance. Each one has its own specific time period when you can do it. The second one is breakdown maintenance. Now, breakdown maintenance is a little different for you assume. Most people think breakdown maintenance is if a machine breaks down, you start servicing it, you start repairing it. So that is called breakdown maintenance. Not necessarily. Men breakdown maintenance has a different meaning also. We'll come to that. But remember, there are three different maintenance options that can be done for a machine. Predictive maintenance is the more modern concept and it is taking form largely on all automated modern equipment. And why it is so, because you need to, or rather you don't need to, there are machines which will predict a potential failure and they will inform you. You don't need to predict. So everything is becoming so automated that the requirement of engineers and the requirement of operators is reducing day by day. 
so you have monitoring devices which will continuously monitor the engines and display on your computer through alarms to video through whatever and you will be informed that there is a pending disaster or pending damage likely to happen so before the damage happens you are expected to take action so that is called predictive maintenance all right so you the you don't have to predict the sensors predict that is why i told you some of the main engines the modern main engines they have to be very very reliable to make them very reliable they have alt umpteen number of sensors fitted on the engines at various parts it is like the main engine being put inside an icu so what do you see in an icu nobody looks at the patient everybody looks at the monitoring screen where they give the pulse the blood pressure the here the sugar content the salt content of that body everything so nobody looks at that patient they only look at that monitor similarly the main engine has been fitted with so many that it continuously gives the performance of the engine should there be a little change in the performance beyond a certain bandwidth an alarm is given the moment that alarm is given you are expected to take action so that is what is called predictive maintenance you predict a potential failure and attend to it before that failure comes anywhere around okay so that is the main meaning between the three breakdown maintenance will have three okay first let's finish it predict preventive maintenance overhaul machinery after a specific time period as ordained by the manufacturer ordained by the manufacturer means recommended by the manufacturer or as per chief engineer's discretions which may override manufacturer recommendations to prevent unplanned failure or breakdown what does it mean see several chief engineers who have had wide experience they will sometimes take a decision which overrides the manufacturer's decisions and that is especially where preventive maintenance is required suppose like they say every 1500 hours you are expected to take out the fuel injector service it and put it back now after every 1500 hours for the last 2 years you have found that there is no trouble with the injectors it is only an exercise that you take it out test it it is working fine you put it back again so the whole exercise of taking it out and putting it back is wasted effort it only make sure that possibly the gaskets have to be changed the wear out of the nuts on the thing will take an effect so it is a exercise that was not required but it is required because the manufacturers have recommended it and manufacturers normally recommend more than what is actually required it has been my experience also and what is the reason manufacturers say you have to open it before 1500 hours by 1500 hours but i have seen they comfortably run for 2500 hours so that is why the chief engineer has the power to override the manufacturer's recommendation because each time you open a component there are several gaskets which have to be changed several o rings have to be changed So my, a spring might require to change because you feel it is not right but overall the whole machine is in very good functional order if the manufacturers were not to recommend their spare parts would not sell um it is a means by which spare parts can sell adequate consumable items can be sold at a premium because the original machine is not sold at much of a profit it is sold at a marginal profit so long the original machine you can be it can be put in your possession and what once it is put in your possession it is an asset to you so long as it performs its function otherwise it's a liability so what happens you are required to continuously maintain it and that maintenance requires spare parts and those spare parts you will have to buy from the same manufacturer who has made them so as you keep buying the spare part his profit margin increases and believe me pro- spare parts cost much more than what were they ordinarily seem and the company's profits are mostly made out of the spare part sale rather than the main machine being sold 
so that is how they are actually generating revenue for their organization it is perfectly justified it is the wisdom of the chief of the buyer that they will check into the cost of the spares the routine spare parts requirements over a period of time to find it financially viable or not so that is why some of the shipping companies they have experienced chief engineers who can sensibly and adequately decide whether that machine has to be opened or it has not to be opened apart from this there are chief engineers who can prepone the whole overhaul process or preventive maintenance process instead of 1500 hours he might suggest 1000 hours he can observe the performance of that machinery deteriorating faster than what the manufacturers have suggested one of the reasons is using poorer and poorer quality of fuels that is why you need to overhaul scavenge valves there are scavenge valves okay scavenge valves required to be overhauled much more often than what has been recommended in the manual so the chief engineer will say we need to overhaul much earlier than what has been suggested to keep that engine in better conditions of running okay so this preventive maintenance figure is not an absolute that it has to be done based on what the manufacturer recommend it is also the discretion of the chief engineer who in consultation with the chief with the uh, superintendent engineer superintendent in the office or the fleet manager will recommend that this maintenance does not require to be done in the process of regularly opening and closing opening and closing there is more damage done to the machine so it is best if it is running fine don't touch it there is a phrase for it if it works don't fix it so that is why preventive maintenance is gradually moving out and being replaced with predictive maintenance of course a lot of ships are still following out the routine maintenance or preventive maintenance it is not totally out of function it is there but the modern ships are gradually doing less of preventive maintenance and going more into predictive maintenance so your concept on preventive maintenance should not be hard bound that this has to be the way it is so preventive maintenance has a relaxation depending on what the senior engineers decide on okay next is breakdown maintenance now here you have to pay a little attention because your original understanding of breakdown maintenance will be a little different now breakdown maintenance can be subdivided into planned maintenance planned breakdown maintenance and unplanned breakdown maintenance there are two distinctive areas of breakdown maintenance what is a planned breakdown maintenance planned this allows the component or equipment to run till it fails it is also called run to failure replacement is cheaper than overhauling the item periodically all right one of the examples i will tell you that ceiling fan that you have on top of your head how often do you take it down every 6 months call a electrician who will open it up clean it put fresh grease in the bearings check the bearings if it is working fine then put it back put fresh grease put it up and then ask you for 700 bucks for his fees so every 6 months you spend 700 rupees 700 rupees 700 rupees so within a year and a half you will have spent more than the cost of the fan is the cost of maintenance justified it is not so it is best to have that fan running till it breaks down or till it gives some problems then when you take it down you find it is beyond use you simply throw it out get a new fan it is definitely much cheaper to replace that fan than to periodically overhaul that fan all right because a fan if you see it last 10 15 20 i have a fan which is lasting more than 36 years and there's no problem it's excellent running fine i've never greased it never done anything but it's running so i have saved so much of money in routine maintenance expenditures so that is why planned maintenance means you let it run till it breaks down 
Another example is your switches, electrical switches inside your house. How often do you open up the switches, clean the contact, put it back again, remove all the dust and put it. If you call an electrician to do it, he'll ask you for 200 rupees and that switch costs 20 rupees. So it's cheaper to replace that switch when it gets defective rather than to call a technician to repeatedly do maintenance every six months. So that is the concept of planned breakdown maintenance. Now, what is unplanned breakdown maintenance? So in spite of prevent, performing preventive maintenance, a machine may fail. You may have done regular maintenance on those fuel injectors every 1500 hours as per the manufacturer recommendation. But one fine day you suddenly find there's black smoke coming out from the funnel. And then you find that the exhaust temperature of one of the units is come, dropped. So immediately know that fuel injector is not working properly. It is injecting fuel in a way where it is not properly being atomized or penetrated. So the fuel which is coming into the chamber is not burning completely. Though the other units are working fine. One unit, the fuel is not being atomized and generated. Something is wrong with the spring. Something is wrong with the seat of the valve or it is stick, stuck, or the or holes have become big, something is wrong with that injector. So then, but you have done preventive maintenance. You have checked that valve before putting it back, and it was working fine. But during the course of time, till its next overhaul period, it has gone bad. So then what do you do? Then you take it out and do the repair, possibly change the needle valve and guide, put it back, retest it, and put it back again. So this. Maintenance has come in between the preventive maintenance running hours. So this is called unplanned breakdown maintenance. It has broken down in spite of doing your preventive maintenance. So you get the concept of what is planned breakdown maintenance and unplanned breakdown maintenance. I hope it is reasonably clear. Paran, have you understood what I've said? Yes, sir. Good. Okay, let's move on. Now let's go on to predictive maintenance. What is predictive maintenance? When diagnostic parameters indicate a fault which may lead to a failure, maintenance is performed, irrespective of time duration to prevent costly breakdowns and failure issues. Okay, now I'll tell you a very detailed one and it will give you an idea of others. Okay, now you see every component every machinery component suppose this is a part of a connecting rod okay if you strike it it has a frequency at which it vibrates all right so it is a natural frequency of that component it could be anything one of the bearings whether it is the piston rod whether it is a piston crown but usually we go into components which are under a lot of stress we don't take the frequency of a crankcase door that tanky door, you don't expect it to fail. But connecting rod, you may have a possibility of crack or failure. So that uh, connecting rod has a natural frequency, which means if you hit it, it will vibrate at a certain frequency. And this frequency is the fingerprint of that connecting rod. This frequency will not be the same with the other connecting rods. If this one has a frequency of 327 cycles per second, so the other one, we may have 325. Another one will have 315. So they're all different. So this is considered a fingerprint of that particular connecting rod. So you have a sensor on that, which can transmit that frequency continuously to a receptor. And that receptor receives the frequency of vibration of that component continuously. And it records it into your computer, in your database. So in your database, you have already got 327 recorded for number seven unit uh, connecting rod. And the signal coming from the connecting rod through your transmitter receiver devices is 327. So everything is fine. It is vibrating at its normal frequency. Now what happens if there is a crack in that connecting rod? Obviously that frequency will change. Moment it changes, the signal will be sent directly to your database and the database in your computer will compare what is fed in or measured value and what is recorded value. And if there is a difference between the two, 
alarm is set off. So you will immediately know that something is wrong with the connecting rod. So before any failure can happen, just a crack has developed and that crack has, is not going to fail overnight. It will take some time for that crack to keep expanding till it has a failure. So this frequency is a diagnostic parameter which will indicate to you the health condition of that component. Similarly, you will have thermometers. Thermometer is also a diagnostic. Uh, thermometer is not the temperature indication is a diagnostic parameter of that particular fluid cooling water. Okay. Similarly, the low boil pressure. The low boil pressure is a diagnostic parameter which indicates the fault which may lead to a failure. So the loop oil pressure, when it drops to a certain level, it means adequate loop oil is not able to go to all the parts of the engine. So that low loop oil pressure is a diagnostic parameter. So these, it may be loop oil pressure, it may be cooling water temperature, it may be frequency of vibration, it may be amplitude of vibration, it may be sound. So these are all diagnostic parameters which are monitored and kept and, 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 and are compared against a record which has already been fed in. And if there is any variation, an alarm will come. And that alarm indicates that something is not right. So a failure is predicted. And based on that signal, you immediately take action. So the chance of a failure is almost nil. So that is why the main engine, it has got so many sensors. And those sensors are sent to a computer which has been already been entered with a database in which the the limitations of the pressure now the pressure when it draw it stays between four and five it is considered satisfactory when it drops below three then the alarm will come so in other words from three to six is considered acceptable as the bandwidth at which the pressure may fluctuate all right. If the fluctuation of pressure goes beyond this bandwidth, then the alarm will come. The bandwidth may be three to six bar. So the pressure is median of 4.5. Okay. So it may go down to four. It may come up to five. It may go down to 4.5. Then again, four, five. So it remains within a certain bandwidth. If it drops below the bandwidth or goes above the bandwidth, alarm will be sounded. And that is a diagnostic parameter to indicate a fault. That means somewhere something has happened where the oil pressure has suddenly dropped. It could mean anything. It could mean that the pressure regulating valve spring has got broken. So it is releasing pressure at a much lower pressure. So the ultimate pressure in the pipeline is low. It could also mean that a bearing has shifted so that there is excess clearance which is allowing excess oil to flow through. It is not that low pressure means poor lubrication. In fact, lower pressure means greater clearance, where more oil is going through. So the oil going through is adequate. But if most of the oil goes through a defective bearing where there's maximum clearance, the oil will not have enough pressure to reach the other bearings or other places within the engine which also require an equal quantity of lubricating oil. So the other places within the engine will be starved of the oil. That is why that pressure has to be within a certain bandwidth. And if it is at, within that certain bandwidth, it ensures that all parts of the engine are receiving the requisite amount of lubricating oil. Okay. If the pressure drops, it means some parts are getting more oil. And in the process, the other parts are not getting oil. Okay, this is with low pressures. Now let me tell you something with high pressures. If you start the engine after doing some work or anything, and then you find the pressure has to be between four and five. All right, but the pressure shows seven and eight. What does it mean? You feel very content. Ah, the pressure is excellent. Now good pressure means all the bearings are getting oil. No, it does not mean that. On the contrary, it means there is no clearance, no requisite clearance between the two contacting faces. So the oil is not able to go inside. So it is building up a pressure 
which is shown as 7 bar. So 7 bar is a negative. It is not a satisfactory condition for the engine where it is not getting adequate oil. The clearance has reduced. There may be some amount of oil going in to provide the lubrication, but not adequate amount of it to cause the cooling. Your lubricating oil is not strictly for lubrication. It is also for cooling. So the quantity of going oil going through has to be adequate to provide for lubrication as well as cooling. So if the pressure shown as 7 and 8 bar where it should be 4.5, it is a reason for worry. All right. So that is what it is. So predictive maintenance is all the diagnostic parameters which can be interpreted as something wrong with the engine. That is, you predict that there is a possible failure going to happen because this diagnostic parameter shows very high temperature or very low temperature, whichever it is. It has to be within a certain bandwidth. Okay, so this helps to reduce frequency of maintenance without incurring the cost of doing too much of preventive maintenance. Each time you do preventive maintenance, there is a cost involved. The cost of manpower, the cost of time, the cost of spare parts, the cost of consumable items. So all these are, and the cost of error. You might make an error while doing preventive maintenance, which will cause the unplanned breakdown. You understand? So maintenance sometimes is more damaging, or rather preventive maintenance is sometimes more damaging than what would expect. If you make a mistake in assembling some part and it becomes the reason for failure, then what good was the maintenance? So that angle has to be also taken into consideration. Okay, so this is when a possible failure is predicted. You do this maintenance when possible failures are predicted. Next, what you have is overhaul. So I hope you boys have got some idea of what is maintenance as regarding to engines and engine room on board the ship. It is preventive maintenance, which is also called routine maintenance. It is also called breakdown maintenance and that breakdown maintenance may be unplanned or it may be planned. Third one is predictive maintenance, which is become, which is, which is becoming more the norm in modern machines, modern engines. All right. So the key phrase in predictive maintenance is if it runs, don't fix it. If it is running fine, don't fix it. That's it. That's the main bottom line. Okay. Now let us go into what are overhaul procedures that are to be followed on board. One is top overhaul. All these maintenance programs they are charted. You have a specific chart given by the company. That company has specific, it is called PMS, Preventive Maintenance Scheme. Or period, sorry, Periodic Maintenance Scheme. Preventive and periodic is the same because preventive maintenance is done during the same intervals, time periods. So, Periodic Maintenance Scheme, PMS. All right. So within this, every few thousand hours or few hundred hours, you are required to open up a machinery and do the job. Most ships are still following out preventive maintenance schemes and you have to follow it out whether you like it or not. Most chief engineers who are not very experienced, they will want to keep to black and white records and they will follow out exactly as the manual suggests. Only a little daring and more considerate chief engineer will decide on taking decisions of his own. It may be to postpone the preventive maintenance. It may be to prepone the maintenance. His objective is to ensure that the engine is always, always in good health. All machinery. So he might ask you to work a little more than what is required in the best interest of the company bottom line. Okay. So overhaul procedures are largely based on top overhaul and major overhaul. So what is top overhaul? So top overhaul for four-stroke engines means removal of the cylinder heads, overhaul and recondition of inlet and exhaust valves and their mountings. Okay, this is the first part. 
So in the first check engine, you will need to dismantle the inlet exhaust valves, check the seats, maybe lap them a little bit, and then check the guide, check the tappet clearances after assembly. Apart from this, you will need to remove the mountings. So what are the mountings? The air starting valve, the relief valve, the fuel injector, the indicator cock. Okay, these are the four apart from the inlet and outlet valves. So you need to open them up and then overhaul them and put them back. Generally, the relief valve in a four-stroke engine, we don't fiddle around with. We don't touch it. Why? Because they are wire locked and with a stamping. It is sealed. So if that seal is disturbed, then it will not be recognized as a safe item. So that seal, it is at the most, if it has been working fine, you just clean it from the outside. Do not upset the spring setting. And if there is a seal, you ensure that the seal is there. But what happens on board is a little different. There are people who will open it up if there is any indication of leakage. So they will remove it, re-dive it, tap it, and bring back the spring to the same pressure as what was there earlier. That is, they use a caliper to measure or a divider to measure the height at which the spring has been compressed, make the requisite punch marks, and then again, when tightening, bring back to the same position. That divider or caliper is made sure that it is not disturbed after the punch marks are made and the measurements taken and kept aside. And then you open it up. After it's opened, cleaned, overhauled, you need to put the spring back to its original position. So after this position, those two punch marks must be at the same distance. So this indicates that the spring has been compressed to the required level. Maybe one kg per centimeter square different plus minus will be the result. The relief valve is removed. The air starting valve is removed. The fuel injector is removed and overhauled. Proper overhauling, meaning you take it out, clean it, lap it, again put it back and retest it. That means you have to check the inside, how much of dirt has accumulated, whether fuel oil deposits are there, whether it is corroded, and whether it can run till the next overhaul period. This top overhaul will be stipulated for every few thousand hours, and it is dependent on the manufacturer and their recommendation. Top overhaul generally happens every, I think, 3,000 hours, and major overhaul, maybe 10,000 hours. It is different from engine to engine. That is why I have not any given any figures of the number of hours at which it is done. It would be very unjust if I give MAN figures, because then Sulzer has got different, Pilsik has got different, Mitsubishi has got different. All engines will have slightly different figures. So it is after a stipulated running period. That period is recommended by the manufacturer. So this is first step in the overhaul. In the second case, the turbocharger blower and charge air cooler cleaning is required in the top overhaul, remember. Now the turbocharger blower is generally given water wash. You can open it out and have it physically cleaned with chemical and soap water or carbon remover with a paint brush. How do you clean it? You have to be very gentle with turbocharger blower. A little damage to it will unbalance the the whole system. So you need to change the oil. You need to do the air charge cleaning. That means the air which is coming from the blower is cooled and then given into the scavenge manifold. So this air cooler has to be cleaned. This cooler cleaning is not a difficult proposition because already uh, pre-arranged pipelines with a shower is already there. You only need to circulate the chemical continuously through that air cooler. And that chemical is generally a carbon remover. Most of the dirt that accumulates inside that air cooler is carbon and lube oil because lube oil vapor is there all over the engine room. And the air turbocharger, it is drawing air from the engine room. So there is carbon, there is carbon always. And it is deposited on the air cooler fins. So you have a chemical, which like a shower, pours over that 
spins and at the bottom it collects and again puts it back in the tank there is a separate tank for this where there is a continuous circulation so we leave it overnight the night duty fifth engineer he will be in charge to see that it is continuously working so next morning they only wash it down with water and put it back in place so that is your air charge or charge air cooler cleaning procedure apart from this top overhaul also includes renewing or renewal of the turbocharger bearing if and only if the condition or the operating hours warrant such a change in other words turbocharger bearings which are also changed after a stipulated number of running hours and that is given by the manufacturer because they are pr prone to fatigue failure that is why turbocharger bearings have to be changed even if they look very good and there is no complaints from them you will need to change it because they are prone to fatigue failure also much like the bottom end bearing bolts of a four stroke engine all right so that is it or if the second engineer or chief engineer decides that the bearing is not in very good condition it is worn out it requires an expert to decide whether that bearing is worn out or not because turbochargers generally bearings don't give trouble unless something goes wrong with the engine otherwise turbocharger bearings are they last for the full period of their operating hours and operating hours may be actually 30 40000 hours the actual operating hours before any chance of failure takes place but the manufacturer will say 20000 hours if you run for 30 40000 hours before it fails the manufacturer is possibly not going to sell his spare bearings again to you so they have to make some arrangement to ensure that the turbocharger also remains safe and their spare parts are also sold so that's why this they specify a little less than what the bearing can actually run for okay so a chief engineer will possibly recognize these points and instead of 20000 hours he will change it to 25000 hours well before the 30000 hours when the actual bearing can or may fail so he will change it at 25000 hours so that way he keeps delaying the purchase of fresh spare parts and helps the company in having a better revenue system okay next is inspection of cabs all coming under top overhaul inspection of cams followers evidence of deterioration of hardened surfaces especially at the fuel pumps you see you have the camshaft and on the camshaft you have cams which are operating the fuel pumps which are also operating the push rods for the rocker arm and which is also operating the distributor and possibly it is also it is does not have much work there it has got a uh, over speed trip device which does nothing unless there is speed over tripping so that part of it is not of any consequence in fact that part is never touched because that part is supposed to work only in the case of an emergency it's not a regularly operating part the fuel cams and the cams for the push rod all are regularly working parts now the fuel cams have the maximum load much more than what the push rods have the push rods are only operating the valves all right the fuel cam they are operating under a hydraulic pressure which is enormous pressure which has to be which has to overcome the spring pressure set on the fuel injector to inject the fuel now <clears throat> apart from this the pump itself also has a spring okay now if you see two round discs if they meet each other they meet only at a point or a strong thin line if you two wheels if you make contact with them their contact surface is one thin line all right but the load is enormous so the pressure per unit area becomes very high so this force becomes very high at the cams or at the rollers and there is possibility of considerable wear down because the lubricating oil gets squeezed out between the surfaces so unless 
you have extraordinary lubricating oils. So because of lack of lube oil between two contacting faces at a high load and a small area, wear down of these parts are not uncommon. Between the cam and the roller, the roller has a little softer material as compared to the cam. So the roller is more likely to wear out or wear down and you are expected to check whether there has been any wear down. I have had an experience where a good segment of the roller was worn out and still the engine was running. We were marveling at that engine, how it is still running and without any complaints. I, I still can't believe what was there inside. But it was very severely worn down and that roller had become blue. It had become, you see, uh, shining metal surfaces. If you heat it with a flame, there's a discoloration. That discoloration arises out of heating. Now, this roller we found, it had changed color for half the roller because the part, part which was worn out has been continuously rubbing on the cam without the roller rotating. It was rubbing rather than rotating. Rubbing rather than rolling. Because rolling friction is much less. But rubbing, that, that roller had worn out and the whole roller had become blue in color. So it was a potential tank case explosion which did not happen. Mercifully, it did not happen. So that is why you need to check these conditions. Okay. Next is checking and checking the condition and calibrating fuel pumps if imbalance of exhaust temperatures are noted. In other words, if there is a severe power imbalance, that means one unit is giving more power than the other, then you need to check the timing of the fuel pumps. And this timing is not fiddled around easily unless absolute confirmation is there that the fuel pump timing is wrong. One of the ways to get to know whether the fuel pump timings are satisfactory or not satisfactory is to take indicator cards. Once you take indicator cards, most of the units will be more or less okay. One unit or maximum two units, you will find they are haywire. The indicator cards are haywire. So draw card is the card where you will be told or indicated that the combustion process is unsatisfactory. Either there it is too early knocking of the engine or there is too late that also causes knocking on the engine. Okay. So these are the reasons you will need to check the camshaft and cams and calibration of fuel pumps. Large engines. In the large engines, you need to do crankcase inspections. I think I've already given to you what all are, is to be inspected inside a crankcase. Either you check up your uh, semester five notes on cam uh, crankcase inspection. It is there. It is there in the fifth semester notes of mine. So it must have been given to you during fifth semester. So you need to check the crankcase inspection. And there are about 15, 20 items which you have to check. Apart from cram crankcase inspection, you need to do or check crankshaft alignment. This crankshaft alignment is done through crank web deflection. That means the webs have a tendency to deflect. This deflection has to be measured for a complete revolution. And then it is indicative of how well the crankshaft is properly aligned. If the deflections are beyond the limits as stipulated by the manufacturer, you will have to change some of the main bearings. The main bearings, clearances will have to be taken, thickness of the shells have to be taken, and accordingly the bearings will have to be replaced. Discretion of chief engineer to include or exclude other components based on engine performance. So if he is there on board for a long time, he is able to make a very calculated decision. He can make a decision whether the particular component has to be opened, whether it will be not opened, or it has to be opened before time. Everything he can decide. And it is up to him. Okay, boys, we'll do one thing. Let us take one five-minute break. 
I want to get some hot water for my throat, and I will be back again. Okay, so I am keeping the page on, but at the same time, for five minutes, we'll take a break. I want to get some hot water for my throat. Okay. Now time is twenty-two by twenty-seven. We'll be back.
all right boys i am back and we can get back to our subject i have got my hot water ready <clears throat> the throat is very sensitive you know and non stop talking is quite damaging for the throat so we were just talking about top overhaul and ultimately it is the discretion of the chief engineer to include or exclude other components based on engine performance the chief engineer has a lot of power in the engine room and he can decide whether a machine has to be opened up or not opened up usually he takes if it is a large machine like the main engine he can take suggestions from the company make his suggestions and then what the engineer superintendent and fleet manager in consultation with the manufacturer they will tell him sometimes if they take instructions from the manufacturer the manufacturer will definitely say something that is to their advantage so sometimes a lot of chief engineers and superintendents who have had a lot of experience with machine they can decide for themselves they don't need the manufacturer's recommendations or suggestions all right they know the angle of the manufacturer so they proceed with in the best interest of the company and your development your preparation your experience should be based and used in the best interest of the company that's how you become a loyal person on board the ship you must not be a liability in the sense it cost the company enormously in spare parts spare parts are what is most damaging for the company or rather financially draining for the not damaging i will say they are financially draining for the company some engineers keep asking for spare parts and spare parts cost a fortune much more than the engine if you look at it the engine by itself did not cost much at the time of sale but it is the spare parts on which the company's generate revenue so your requirement that's why indians were so much preferred in the years uh, in past that engine engineers used to make the best use of all provisions that they got whatever they had they made sure that that particular item gave the maximum service before it was rejected whereas most of these foreigners from europe if something goes wrong throw it out put a new one and they put a new one whether it was required or not they used to simply replace the cause the 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 habit of replacing whereas for us it was the habit of ensuring whether it can give any more output if it is possible to repair you repair it and some of the most difficult repairs have been conducted out by indian engineers so the requirement of frequent spare parts is reduced you want to be a company man minimize your asking for spare parts repeatedly okay major overhaul what is a major overhaul it encompasses almost everything of the engine except maybe a crankshaft removal from the place okay so what is major overhaul <clears throat> dismantling running parts which means main bearings bottom end bearings crosshead bearings piston assemblies liners cylinder head valve gear fuel pumps injection equipment are to be opened and cleaned inspected and measured for wear that is a major overhaul it's as good as decarbonizing is a major overhaul decarbonizing we do not do everything together we do focus only on the decarbonizing so that the other items will fall after a certain period of time so every 3000 hours you are supposed to do top overhaul every 6000 hours you are supposed to do major overhaul so it is not that main bearing bottom end bearing all are done in one day it's not that way possibly main bearings of two units is done on one day then on another day main bearings for another two units is done 
and those hourly periods are recorded so that after the required thousand of hours the main bearings for those two units again come on the same date so you do those training so everything is marked out with time so you are expected to do after so many running hours you have to open the bearing now it does not mean it will fall exactly at the same time after six months or two months it is based on the number of running hours not exactly the calendar but the number of running hours now if your ship goes into a place like inside a uh, uh, anchorage and there is no place for the ship to go on the berth to unload the cargo this can happen for three months so everything is delayed for three months so within those three months you can do a lot of other jobs which will not be required to open up any of these parts so that is the time most chief engineers try to exploit and get the maximum repairs reconditioning done which does not interfere with the routine opening of these components your job on the ship will not be limited to only operating the machine maintenance of the machine is also there but that is also reducing to some extent you see if the number of engineers are reduced on board you possibly can't be doing all these jobs yourself so what they do they have time when the ship comes to port they call shore based workshops shore based workshops will come and do most of the work and then go off and you are required to run the engines so you become more of systems engineer than a maintenance engineer gradually the marine engineer is giving way to becoming a systems engineer which means he understands the systems of operation largely because they are very automated your concepts on electronics has to be top notch and you will be mainly operating and finding small small faults you should be rectifying but where maintenance is concerned you will be gradually eased off in other words opening up a bearing decarbonizing these things are gradually being eased off in the more modern ships so the number of persons on board the ship is also being reduced where they will work simply as systems engineers rather than maintenance marine engineers you will become systems engineers you'll be doing most of the operations checking for connectivity satisfactory all electronics the scenario has changed completely from what it was 10 years back so you have to be very thorough with your understanding of electrical machines electronics a marine engineer is a jack of trade and a master of all so he has to be good in all aspects okay apart from all this what you saw in a next is checking cooling water spaces for fouling and removal what fouling and removal okay now cooling water spaces they are continuously circulating cooling water it may be lube oil it may be cooling water now this cooling water it may carry some debris or deposits they will be right at the bottom to inspect these cooling water spaces you need to open certain manhole covers certain flange pipes and things like that and there you will get a fair idea of what the rest of the walls internally are like i have not seen a very heavy scales deposit very rarely is there any heavy scales deposited and those scales will be deposited if you have not been maintaining the quality of the cooling water over time so that cooling water requires maintenance also in other words there are chemicals which have to be added and then tests are to be added tests are to be made whether it is alkaline whether it is acidity what is the ph value and then sometimes silt that means parts of rust and parts of machine which are washed off will come and settle at the bottom most part of the entire cooling system so that is the part you need to open up so after draining out you will check that portion where there could be some debris some silt it's a form of a fine paste it will be form of dust it will be calcium sulfate it could be any of the chemicals that have solidified to so that so why is this damaging why is this little bit of silt damaging and which part is most damaging this silt it can cause damage to the lube circulating pumps 
see the pumps when they are working, they have what are called shaft seals. The shaft seals are very precision equipment. That means the sealing of the surface is on a very smooth surface. It consists of a carbon ring and a stainless steel ring. Both are pressed against each other to provide an absolute smooth surface. These are mechanical seals and centrifugal pumps. And they provide a sealing. So if any debris, any solid particles happen to come between the two surfaces, it will scratch that carbon surface. It will not have a smooth surface. And then the leakage starts. If it scratches the surface, means the surface is uneven. And the, and the stainless steel component will also possibly get scratched. And then the two mating surfaces will not be absolutely smooth. So then the leakage starts. And once the leakage starts, more and more debris tends to come into that space and cause damage to the seals. These mechanical seals are precision equipment. They have to be handled very gently, very carefully. The alignment of the two has to be perfect to give a perfect seal. So no drop of water will leak from there. The older seals, they were very crude. They were uh, packing, uh, uh, rope-like packing with gland packing. And in fact, we used to keep the glands a little loose so that there used to be a little water coming out from the gland seals. And this water was considered as the lubricant, the lubricant between the shaft and the rope packing. If you have the rope packing very tight, then the load on the motor becomes very high. So because the motor has to overcome the friction between the rope of the gland packing and the shaft. So these are not very effective seals. But the mechanical seals which are there now in almost all the pumps which you will be facing, you will need to have them in good order. And that can be in good order if you do not have any silt or scale circulating with the cooling water. The cooling water has to be very clean. There are filters, but those filters are not very fine filters. There are big opening scale filters which will prevent any cloth piece or anything like that being filtered. So checking of cooling water spaces for fouling and removal of deposits. How will you remove the deposits? If there is a scale formation, then we'll use 5% hydrochloric acid solution to circulate through the cooling water spaces. And that has to be washed out and drained thereafter. After that, you use fresh water, distilled water, in fact, with the requisite chemicals or nitrates to keep the nitrate level within certain limits. And periodically, you need to change the uh, periodically you need to test the water for its nitrate level. I think 1200 is the figure 1200 ppm. I, I don't remember all those figures right now, but maybe different uh, engines will have different cooling mediums which allow for different cooling standards. But most of them are intended to stop corrosion on the inside and erosion cannot be avoided. Erosion will be with the flow of water and keep maximum access to all the crevices that are there. OK, so cooling water is one part of your engines, I think, in your fifth semester. It was in the fifth semester. Other than this, in your major overhaul, you will continue with the renewal of defective, irreparable components or those which are worn and cannot complete the next period of service. Now, when you open a, a valve and Suppose an exhaust and inlet valves, you have opened them up and then you find that the exhaust valve is still good, but can run only for the next 2000 hours. Instead of the requisite 5000 hours, it can run for the next 2000 hours. So should you change it or should you not change it? If you don't change it, that means you're losing the value of that valve. You're losing the potential of that valve by not using it for the remaining 2000 hours. And if you change it, uh, if you use it, then again, after 2000 hours, you will have to open it. So there is this decision is mainly taken by the chief engineer. And if he's a good chief engineer, he will decide what is best for the company. Uh, I hope you have understood what I am talking about. Let's ask somebody, Hari Krishna Pal, are you there? Hari Krishna Pal.
no sound so he is not there okay let me talk let me call indrajit maitra no sound are you fellows there or not there i think the fellows who are not responding i will have to mark them absent this is the only way i can get you fellows to be active in your participation of your class otherwise everybody is either put his system on and not paying attention so hari krishna pal absent 8079 And next is Indrajit Maitro, eight zero eight five. Yes, Maitro. What what was the ignition delay for? You have too much of ignition delay. You are not alert. You are not very alert. It's okay. I am leaving it. Next time, if any boy he does not respond, I will have to mark him absent. otherwise i feel i am talking to the wall so better be responsive better be attentive in what the class is going on okay next is renewal of joint seals o rings which are specified life or have been disturbed during overhaul these are actually considered as consumerable parts these consumerable parts once they are used they cannot be used again and they are soft parts joints are actually coming in rolls those rolls have to be cut and they form the gaskets for the flanges which have been opened up um these joints are quite expensive expensive for a ship owner to keep repeatedly buying so you have to be careful in their use and sometimes we require to reuse some of the joints not all some joints need changing if they are very badly damaged some joints can be reused with a coat of grease on the surface grease helps to provide the required sealing other than this you have seals they may be o rings they may be plastic rings they can be so many types of seals that are there which have a specified life or have been disturbed during overhaul then apart from this you need to have calibration of all engine instrumentation divakar tripathi divakar tripathi are you there so 08078 absent okay let me call somebody else uh harshul arora 8081 yes sir okay harshul now you tell me uh what do you understand by calibration of all engine instrumentation what do you understand by calibration of all engine instrumentation see that's why you guys perform poorly in examinations for most of the subjects you are sitting through a class whether you understand or don't understand don't bother to get any clarification but you just sit through the class get your attendance so harshul what is calibration of all engine instrumentation so i think i'll just read through and i will not bother to explain nobody is interested it seems the process of adjusting an instrument to meet the specifications rubbish all few words which have no meaning you see what is engine instrumentation all the automated parts of the engine which gives signals for possible failures your alarm system suppose you are lubricating oil temperature it is set to a certain temperature where alarm is supposed to be given all right let us say 75 degrees temperature the alarm should come for the lubricating oil to get that temperature you need to have a sensor that sensor is possibly fitted in some part of the engine maybe at the engine sump not in the tank but in the sump now if the oil reaches a certain temperature that sensor will send a signal to the alarm system 
and an alarm will be given. All right. Now, if that sensor is defective or if the wire to the sensor is broken, you will never know and the alarm will never come, isn't it? So when the actual temperature is reached, there will be no alarm. So even when the temperature is not reached, there will be no alarm. So if the temperature is not reached and there is no alarm and you think it is fine, but when the temperature is reached and that time also there is no alarm because there is some defect in the sensor or the wire is broken. So you will need to check whether that sensor is satisfactory, whether the wire is broken or not. So you will need to take out that sensor, put it in a hot medium and raise the temperature of that hot medium to 75 degrees centigrade and see if that alarm is working. Then the alarm should be given. So this is checking of all instrumentation and checking whether the temperature at which the alarm comes is 75 degrees centigrade or not. So what we do, suppose it is a cooling water outlet of one unit of an auxiliary engine. There are sensors fitted there. You need to open this sensor, put it in an electric kettle with a thermometer in it or a designated container. Some, some ships have it. We did not. Some ships have a designated container with electrical fitting and with a thermometer inserted inside. And you keep raising the temperature and that sensor is also fitted in that water. So when the temperature on the thermometer comes to 75, that alarm should be given. If it doesn't give, then the software has to be adjusted and ensured that at 75 degrees centigrade, the alarm is given. All right. Then again, it is tested after the adjustment. And the idea is that these sensing devices, which are called uh, not only the sensing devices, the entire gamut of sensing and setting up the alarm to indicate a fault within the engine, is called instrumentation. This goes for having vibration monitors, temperature monitors, pressure monitors. Some of them ships have sound monitors. Some have salinity monitors. So many. There are so many means of measuring an engine condition criteria. All right. So these are called instrumentation. All the yes, setup. Sir. Ah, yes. Sir, 8078 is present, sir. He has written in the chat box. Sir, his mic, mic is not working. His mic is not working. Sir, I am here. My mic is not working, sir. Okay. Okay. We'll allow that. All right. So that is what is instrumentation. So what do you understand by blackout test? Oh, that I've already answered. Kishiti Jaiswal. So if you have any questions, at least Harshul Arora, try to think and write. Do not speak words which have no meaning. You will get into trouble in these placement examinations or any orals. When you say something just for the sake of saying something without. If you don't know, outright be honest and say, I don't know, sir, but I will definitely find out. Or you please tell us. Right now, I am in a position to tell you. After this class is over, there is no chance. I don't have a chance to meet you. And the whole year I'm not going to meet. I've not met any of you fellows. So I don't even know you fellows. So it's a very difficult situation and pathetic. I will say pathetic for us. But we have to continue. Let's move on. Uh, that I hope you have understood what is the meaning of calibration of all engine instrumentation. That means you are checking whether the systems are working to their correct levels in sending signals or alarms to the operator. If it is not sending at that particular value, it has to be reset on your computer. So these values have to be recalibrated and set to the requirements as stated in the manual or your C trial records. Next is a reassembly, power balancing, running instrumented load test to confirm engine performance in accordance to manufacturer specifications or C trials. Now, this is very good to write in an examination or in a write up. On board the ship, you cannot afford to keep running your engines to test them at the instrumented load. Like I just now told you, the cooling water has to rise to 75 degrees centigrade 
for the alarm to come. Now you don't load that engine unnecessarily to raise the cooling water temperature to bring that uh, 75 degree centigrade. Rather, you take out the sensor and fit it, put it into a container which has got cooling water and raise the temperature of the cooling water electrically with a thermometer, observe the thermometer and observe the point at which the alarm comes. So that is as good. So you don't subject your engines or machinery to undue stresses. Okay. So that is why on paper you can write all this reassembly of all the components. Then you do power balancing. Power balancing is understandable. That has to be done. It is setting the fuel racks to ensure that equal power is coming from all the units. Running instrumented load tests to confirm engine performance in accordance to manufacturer specifications of C trial record. That is not always possible, but where it is possible, you will conduct it. Next is, that was all about uh, the major overhaul. Now we will go into the individual details. The piston assembly generally consists of what is the piston assembly in a two-stroke engine? You can be cast. The two-stroke engine piston assembly consists of crown, skirt, rod, piston rings, telescopic pipes or articulated pipes. You may have telescopic pipes or articulated pipes. It is not necessary that you have to have telescopic pipes. You need you can have articulated pipes which also convey the cooling medium to the piston. The idea of an articulated pipe is same as the telescopic pipes. Because the piston is moving, you need to get a cooling medium inside that and out of it. So how will you do it? So you have what are called elbow pipes or articulated pipes. So they bend at the elbow at two places which allows the piston to move up and down. At the same time, maintain connectivity with the coolant to the piston. Now, Divakar Tripathi, have you understood what I've said about articulated pipes? Write it down. What I've asked you about articulated pipes or elbow pipes. Yes, sir. OK. So that is what the piston assembly in a two stroke engine consists of. In the four stroke engine, the piston assembly consists of the piston, the rings, gudgeon pin, circlips, bronze bush, connecting rod. And the piston, it depends if it is using heavy oil or residual fuel as a medium, the piston is likely to be a two-piece piston. The two-piece piston will consist of the crown and the skirt. And most likely, the crown will be either forged steel or cast steel, and the skirt will be of thin cast iron. I have not seen any aluminium cast iron, so I cannot confirm what materials are used for the skirt in medium speed engine pistons. So usually a forged steel or cast steel crown with a cast iron skirt. OK, now once the piston is removed, what will you inspect of that piston? OK. Inspection of the piston on withdrawal, checking on the piston crown, burning. You see, sometimes there is very often it happens that the fuel injected into the combustion chamber tends to fall directly on the piston crown. That is impingement. The, though the atomization penetration forbids this, there are instances where the fuel can fall on the top. If the nozzle holes become big and there is no servicing, no overhaul done, there is a possibility of more fuel coming out and striking the surface of the combustion wall. And the first place that will be impinged with is the piston crown. So the moment the oil falls on the piston crown, the oil burns. And with that, the surface of the piston burns out. So to check whether it is burnt out or not, the piston crown is measured with the help of a template. And this is a template which is used for measuring whether the piston crown has been burnt or not. Now, this is the region where it is burnt. So there will be a clearance between the template and the crown where you can put a filler gauge. And moment that is gone through, it means the surface is burnt. Up to a certain level, the manufacturers allow the piston to continue. 
what is the hazard here is the wall thickness of the piston crown has become thinner and it may fail in time to come so is record has to be made and sent to the company company may say that at the next overhaul period change the piston crown and send the piston crown for reconditioning during reconditioning they will fill up this place with metal and remachine the piston crown entirely to make it as close to possible as original but it will never be the same because the material that will be put on the top will be quite different from the parent metal of the piston crown very difficult to get absolutely the same metal okay next is okay here we are so that is burning of the piston crown next is observe distortion side of the grooves where the piston rings are if the piston rings happen to break then the separating wall between the two grooves may get distorted and this distortion has to be identified see the distortion on the piston crown could lead to regular breaking of piston rings so this distortion has to be identified and if it is distorted within out of limit that piston crown cannot be used because it will regularly cause breakdown breakage of the piston rings Next is uh, check for cracks on top of the piston crown due to thermal and mechanical stress and fatigue. I will show you a diagram just now which shows how the pistons can be cracked on the top. Hmm? Next is scrutinize for hot corrosion at the top and acid corrosion at the lower region. Hot corrosion takes place in a very hot region and this hot corrosion occurs due to sodium and vanadium being present in the fuel oil. So this sodium and vanadium when they react or in the combustion process they form certain salts they are called sodium vanadates these salts if they deposit on the piston crown and if an appropriate temperature is reached they start melting and in the melted condition or semi liquid or liquid condition these salts are very heavily highly severely corrosive and they burn or they, uh, sorry they corrode the surfaces very intensively so that is what is hot corrosion is and it is largely restricted to piston crown exhaust valves exhaust valve trunkings and sometimes it may go to turbocharger turbine blades okay so that is hot corrosion acid corrosion is cold corrosion it is the acid formation due to sulfur mainly in the fuel oil which gives rise to sulfur dioxide and sulfur trioxide now if the dew point is reached at the lower point that means if the temperature of that region is 230 degree centigrade then condensation will take place and in the condensation the sulfur dioxide will form the sulfuric acids this sulfuric acid is very corrosive and the colder regions of the engine unit or in the combustion unit that means the cylinder liner piston skirt the colder regions will have acidic corrosion okay so you need to check the top to the top plan for various vertical scoring due to deposits and accumulation and abrasion this is the region where it is free from the liner and the possibility of deposits taking place is large and when these deposits are scraped off it causes scoring of the surfaces here is the diagram which will be able to show you what it is here is the piston crown the top of the crown if you see is got a crack this crack is in the form of a cross because the top of the piston crown is like a diaphragm when the combustion pressures act they act on top then the diaphragm bends downwards when the pressure is reduced the diaphragm comes back into its normal position so over a period of time the bending and retracting bending and retracting bending and retracting causes fatigue failure that fatigue failure will show up in the form of a crack right at the center okay apart from this the piston crown piston crown when it is compressed from top when the gas pressures are high the bulge the sides tend to bulge out because there it's a hollow piston and it's got walls 
the sides will tend to bulge out and the top layer is going to go down it is going to deflect and the sides are going to bulge outward now this continuous bulging outwards and retraction bulging outwards and retraction may cause failure of the wall this wall has got grooves where piston rings are fitted now the weakest part in the groove is at the corner so when a failure takes place it will originate from the corner and extend to the depth of the wall size and after that it will reach the inside of the piston crown moment that happens there will be a lot of gas pressure going inside the cooling water spaces and then you will see the uh, the pressure gauges fluctuating very heavily see combustion pressures are something like 100 120 bar whereas the cooling water pressure is anything like 3 to 4 bar so when that 100 and odd bar forces itself through the crack obviously the pressure inside the cooling water is going to jump like anything so the jumping of the pressures will be indicated on the pressure gauge so these are the failures of the piston which could happen a th third failure is burning of the sorry abrasive wear of the top land abrasion of the top land is here as it is apart from this burning takes place along the sides of the piston crown now this again here is a means of measuring how much of burnout has taken place on the piston crown All right next is yeah gauge piston crown and grooves for wear that means you have to measure the piston crown by a big micrometer to find out how much the diameter has reduced by checking in various direct positions apart from that piston rings will need to be calibrated check for free movement of the rings and wetness the rings must be wet inspect rubber surface for scoring and scuffing rubbing surfaces not rubber surfaces rubbing surfaces measurement of rings measurement of rings means what is the temperature range there is a question here what is the temperature range for hot and cold corrosion okay now cold corrosion will take place when condensation takes place the usual dew point inside a cylinder liner is around 230 degree centigrade this also happens inside the funnel there also the temperature drops and if there are acidic gases there again corrosion will take place there so the cold corrosion will happen when condensation takes place and interaction with the acidic gases so that is the time when acids are formed so in the region of 230 degrees is what cold corrosion takes place hot corrosion now hot corrosion takes place by melting of the salts which are formed by sodium and vanadium these are called vanadates so the temperatures may be anything from 450 degree centigrade to 1100 degree centigrade but the 1100 degree centigrade salts we are not worried about we are not even worried about those which are reaching 600 700 800 degree centigrade we are worried about the lower temperature salts which get melted at 450 or degree centigrade because there will be some part in the combustion spaces where the temperature uh, in the region of 400 450 degree centigrade when the engine is on maximum load so during this period the corrosion or hot corrosion will take place okay sorry wow why the why the question suddenly coming up now okay kartavya singh sir where are the crack monitoring sensors fitted in the piston assembly in the piston assembly why will they be there it could be there on the connecting rod crack monitoring sensors they can be on the bearings it is just a sensor which is continuously monitoring the frequency the vibration and these are actually called piezoelectric sensors piezoelectric sensors are you know they are quartz crystals 
and any pressure on them will generate an EMF in millivolts. This millivolts is further amplified into volts and the voltage arising from there is indicative of the frequency. If that voltage changes, that means the frequency has changed. You cannot read directly frequency of a component. What is the frequency? How will you measure? That frequency is a vibration mode. It is vibrating at a certain mode. To, me to measure that vibration, you need to have a device which is fitted onto that body. It could be on the connecting rod. It could be on the bearing. It could be on any shaft. It could be on the shaft also. So that vibration is translated into electromotive, sorry, millivolts, EMF, electromotive force. All right. So this millivolts is further amplified. And what voltage is coming is recorded in its normal condition. If there is a change in the vibration, it means there is a change in the frequency. That frequency change is directly related to that component health condition. If it breaks, then the frequency of vibration will change. So that change is ultimately recorded. So these are all. Sir, excuse me. Uh, yeah. Sir, the crack, the crack on any the piston assembly will be monitored by this sensor on connecting rod only. Piston assembly. Piston assembly consists of a lot of things. Identify a particular component. A piston in cannot the piston be, crown. Oh, piston yeah. crown cannot. You will not have a sensor on the piston crown. I have not heard or seen any. Maybe modern engines sir, will how have these. So then how these will be monitored? The cracks, how these will be monitored? Okay. Now this monitoring device. Suppose a connecting rod, because connecting rod is under a lot of shear stress, bending stress, compressive stress, all the stresses. So this device has got a transmitter, a miniature transmitter. And very close to the crankcase, there is a receiver. And this receiver, as the connecting rod keeps passing this place, it will be transmitting that signal to the receiver. That receiver through the wiring is again sent to the control room. Let me see if I have it in this particular plate or not. Mm, okay. Yeah. Now here, have a look at this. This is the connecting rod and it is located right on the bearing itself. So this is a rotating sensor. This is a sensor which is fitted. Let's make it bigger. This is a sensor which is fitted and it is transmitting a signal to a receiver. This is a signal processing unit, SPU, and this is a radio wave pulse, which is called a surface acoustic wave, SAW. So this transmitter transmits the signal of its frequency of that particular component which is moving. And this is ultimately sent to a monitoring and alarm system. So if there is a change in the frequency of vibration of this component, it is transmitted directly to the monitoring and alarm system. So this is how it is fitted in some of the engines. This is one example. There will be many more in different places for the modern engines, how a vibration technique of getting the frequency recorded in the monitoring system. And if there is a change in the frequency, there will be an indication of a fault within that component. And then you will have to stop the engines and find out why that frequency has changed. Possibly, you will have to take a crack test of that component. So before any major failure takes place, you are informed that a potential mishap is in the offing. All right. So that is what it is. I will probably not be able to go through this entire PowerPoint. I will send this PowerPoint to all of you. It is easily readable and easily understandable. So what you are required to do during your maintenance of inspection assembly, and there again, you have a diagram of a piston, two-stroke piston. Here, you have the cooling water passing through the concentric pipes within the piston rod. And this particular piston has got bore cooling with nozzles in it, whereas this one has got bore cooling with cocktail shaker arrangement. 
so when the piston is moving up and down the whole water inside splashes and it goes inside these cooling water spaces to cool the crown of the piston whereas this one has a much more detailed and i would say better cooling arrangement where the cooling water pressure is injected through nozzles directly into the spaces it means when the engine is running these spaces are cooled when the engine is not running these are again still cooled whereas this piston when the engine is running it is cooled momentarily the engine is stopped no cooling water goes inside these spaces because the water will stand still so this effect this is definitely much more effective than what this one is okay this is one of the means then you have crossed bearings where you have to inspect the bearing i think we'll call it off now it's already 11:13 you will be required to do another test so what i will do i will send you this powerpoint program and you will be able to read it through and through if you have any questions you can send it to me but this maintenance is endless it is endless you can take anything and start a maintenance program on it but remember the concept of preventive maintenance breakdown maintenance and predictive maintenance if you understand these three the rest of the maintenance is matter of physical labor work that's it okay so that will be all for today and let me take the attendance there are only 31 boys which means there are several boys who are not present so i will have to take their attention so uh, the the first candidate is uh this is section uh, c so 8078 is starting with 787980808 maybe he is uh, uh withdrawn 8182 83 is again missing 8083 is missing 8384858 is not there 87 is there 8889 is not there 89 is not there 90 is not there 9192 is not there 93 uh karutharan ashwin what's your number 95 sir 95 so 94 is not there 94 is not there 95969789901 okay 2 and 3 are not there 0203 are not there 4 5 6 7 eight is not there 08 is not there 9 10 11 12 13 mrityanjay kumar rana what's your number 14 sir 14 so 8 13 is not there 13 is not there 14 15 16 17 17 and who's the last guy 17 yeah 17 is the last guy so i'm calling out the absentee numbers and withdrawn numbers 8080 83 86 89 90 9294020308 and 13 so that's quite a bit of boys absent uh, follow the uh, ultimately you have to pay fines and the office is very stringent about your attendance nowadays we get the scolding if you are absent so what we cannot do much about your being absent from class you have to be there anyway that will be all for today and i'll be sending you this uh, um powerpoint maintenance which is the last one and if there are any questions you can send them to me and i will clarify them okay so that will be all for today and i'm stopping the recording stop recording